Our next presentation is a really interesting one, something that uh, uh, if we try to do something different, I, I, I think that um, uh, Mr. Walker has found something really out of the, uh, the mainstream for us to, to, to hear about. Uh, this one uh, caught my attention uh, when it was first uh, uh, proposed. It's, uh, Mr. Walker is going to talk us about suicide on the track, the case of Peter Christ. And I think that uh, he also has a book that just uh, has come out, The Last Lap, The Mysterious uh, Demise of Peter Christ in the Annapolis 500. It's just been published uh, this year. So as soon as we get up and going here. Okay. I'm here to talk about my cousin, who is uh, Pete Chris. Pete raced from 1925 at Indy to 1934, nine years. And his career ended uh, with the uh, wreck that you see on the right. He was killed in practice in 1934. Uh, I. Uh, in doing this, I became attracted to this story when I was a little kid. This, uh, uh, you'll see in a minute, his tombstone is in my family cemetery in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, I used to go to that cemetery, and it, uh, frankly, it blew my socks off. You will see why in just a second. But Pete was the son of a wealthy man, John Chris, seated here, who was a multimillionaire. He built railroads and he had marble quarries on his land and many stones from that marble quarry uh, were used to build the uh, buildings on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Like a lot of fathers, and especially like if you know Joseph Kennedy, uh, who fathered John and Robert and Teddy, uh, 
he wanted to build a dynasty. And he pushed his three sons, and the three sons from left to right are John uh, Jr., Pete, who is the race driver, and Harmon. And he pushed these kids very hard. He wanted them to be risk takers. He wanted them to be daring. Uh, Pete began driving on the back roads of Knoxville. So he, was, he would have loved this road course. Uh, he would have loved the first road course here at Watkins Glen. Uh, he drove on roads like that. And uh, he, he learned how to drive using his father's uh, 1920 Marmon, which was uh, he souped up and, and drove around the back roads. Uh, there was one race course in Knoxville, and he drove on it. Uh, one day, however... Um, as he was just uh, approaching his, uh, uh, he was 24, a friend asked uh, to be driven to Knoxville from this rural area where they lived, and Pete looked at him and joked. Pete was a very uh, gregarious kind of person and, and great fun. And he said to this kid, I'll have you in Knoxville or in hell in 10 minutes. It was a very cold night. They hit some black ice. The Mormon flipped over. The, the boy was killed, and Pete was knocked unconscious. He apparently had uh, a traumatic brain injury. He began suffering from flashbacks and uh, uh, things of that sort. But he kept driving, and his father knew he, his son was depressed, and he knew only one way to go, and that was to uh, keep charging. So he, he and Pete took the train to Indi uh, Indiana, and he bought his son a, 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 the top-of-the-line Duesenberg Roadster. And to be in, uh, to buy that car, which was $10,000, by the way, um, and the average salary, I think, was about $600 a year then. So you can imagine what kind of wealth they had. But he had to become a member of the Duesenberg team. And uh, Fred and Augie took him out to the track, tried him out, and they knew that my cousin had speed. This man could travel. Pete got off to a fast start. Uh, in his first race, which was at one of the board tracks in Culver City, California, he couldn't get the car started uh, when the flag dropped. He started dead last and finished second going through the field, uh, and this, this man knew how to, to achieve speed. He was eighth in his rookie year at Indy, the Duesenberg brothers, and Peter DiPaolo, by the way, whom I talked with during the course of my research, um, tried to get him to slow down a bit because he was impetuous. And uh, uh, so he did finish eighth at the Indy in, in 1925. Um, Tommy Milton, a very famous driver, uh, elected to take Pete to Monza to race uh, in, against Formula One or Grand Prix cars. And uh, Pete uh, started off on the front row and... Uh, the second uh, sweep around, you know the parabolica curve, which is steeply banked. He came out of that curve in first place and set fast lap. Now, he thought, because of the difference in, um, in, in language, he thought he had set a track record, and that will come into play in a while, but he had the fast lap. Set the third lap, the car... Uh, transmission gave out, and he spun into a curve called the Porto Lesmo. 
and it's claimed a lot of cars. It's still there. When you watch Monza, you will see it. He switched to Miller. Uh, Miller, he, he had driven a couple of the front-wheel drive Millers, and he liked them. He liked board tracks. So he switched to Miller, uh, and he had purchased a brand-new Miller 91 for the 1926 race. Uh, Miller, I don't know whether you know it, but it's a terrific. It is the epitome of racing in, in the 20s and 30s. Uh, a 91 cubic inch engine, a dual overhead cams, uh, supercharged, and front wheel drive. And uh, he was expected to, to finish high in the 1926 race. Unfortunately, something happened to him, which happened to a lot of us a couple of years ago. He caught the flu. He was hospitalized, and uh, Tommy Milton brought several drivers for him to interview to, to fill in for him. The one he chose was a man, little known man from California, named Frank Lockhart. Lockhart took his car and won the race his rookie year. And that, uh, that event sort of really uh, uh, sort of put the skids to Pete. He never was quite the same after that. To give you a sense of what Pete was like, uh, you can see, by the way, they had the biggest house in Knoxville, uh, still beautiful. His sister lives there, and by the way, his sister who is now departed, uh, helped me tremendously. Her name was Hazel, and she gave me all of his papers, would answer all my questions. Uh, you can see he always had the best cars, Auburns, whatever it was, he had it. A very handsome fella, uh, not uh, terribly attracted to the women. He was not a, 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 what was the name of the guy who, Smoked a lot and drank a lot. West, no, the the Formula One driver. Yeah, exactly. He, not that kind of guy, but he was always making jokes. He always dressed in a three-piece suit, and he would come to the track in that three-piece suit and go into the shed and change into his overalls. Generally, he would leave his tie on. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of what he was like when he set the track record or set fast lap at Monza. He went downtown that night and sent his father, and he was always trying to please his father, of course. He sent him a, a one-line telegram, broke track record and car, love Pete. And that's sort of the way he conducted himself with self-deprecating humor. You can see them here. Uh, uh, the, the, the caption on that picture was uh, showing how you change a tire at Indy. So with a sledgehammer, I'm sure they were bulky. Now, look at the photograph. When Pete was killed in 1934, his father hired an Italian sculptor to make that tombstone. And uh, as you can see, it's probably five feet tall, 18 feet long, and it has on it an exact replica of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Down to the bricks, thousands of little carved bricks. Now, the other remarkable thing is that car goes off right where Pete went off the track and was killed. You can see it in the lower right. It's an incredible. When I saw that first, when I was four or five years old, I was captivated. It was over for me. I had to know more about this guy. And I have spent uh, off and on through my life uh, learning about Pete Chris. Pete never finished another 500. He was uh, running fifth in 1932 in one of those Studebaker uh, junk formulas. Uh, crashed into turn one at 475 miles. 
uh, the friends and owners, he gave up his car, he sold his cars, and he would race at Indianapolis. And everybody loved to see him coming. He, he, was, he was just so admired by people. Uh, he had a series of DNFs and, and crashes. And, and the crash in 1934 resulted in his death and the death of a riding mechanic, which is uh, one of the more perplexing problems of this story. Uh, as you can imagine, it, it captured my attention. When we would, though in those days, we would go to the cemetery to clean the graves, that sort of thing, and I would always take a, a, a little racing car and bump it around the track, as you can see. And by the way, you can see that the motto on it is the last lap, and that's where the title of the book comes from. Now, uh, when Pete crashed, it, it was a national story. Um, and, and I found something that really amazed me. And uh, at that time, uh, by the way, the subtitle here says, Death of Pete Chris, a mystery, drivers say. And we'll come back to that in a minute. That caught my attention. And then the subtitle says, uh, car wrecked while apparently under control. Now, here's what happened. He was going at a relatively slow speed, about 100, and these cars could blast along on the straights up to about 160. And uh, he went into turn one, and then got on top of the retaining wall and slid perfectly balanced for 75 yards. Perfectly balanced. A state patrolman saw this and swore to this. He said, I could not believe that he was balanced right on top of this. The way he got up on top, look at this, look at this element that the track had installed in, in a few years earlier. This is a berm that comes up uh, from the track level to the wall. And I think that it was, I think that this berm was put in in hopes that it would push the cars away from the wall and save crashes because as you know, turn one in India is the I, I think the, the the most dangerous curve in, in in racing. At any rate, he rode up that berm, got on top of the retaining wall, and sat there for that 75 yards. It was a spectacular crash. They spun off after about 75 yards and uh, hit a tree. Um, that was in the backyard of one of those houses on the south end of the track. And uh, they hit, unfortunately, right at the cockpit. It killed both Pete and the, the, the riding mechanic. Uh, it uh, nearly severed Pete's legs from his body. So they were in, they, the mechanic lived very briefly. Pete was killed instantly. So I wanted to solve the mystery. Um, a bunch of drivers and officials, winner of the Indy 500, concluded in one of the print stories, they said, this is the strangest death in all racing history. And I was determined to solve that mystery. By the way, I, I might tell you just a little sideline. The cover art was done uh, by an artist, believe it or not, in Ukraine. Uh, my publisher contacted this fella, and uh, he did that wonderful cover art. Now, I did some research on suicide. Uh, the, the article had given me uh, some evidence to think that there might have been suicide involved. Freud, of course, started 
uh, his research on the death wish. And th that's notorious. We know that it's spurious to some degree. But he said that people who go through a trauma, as Pete did when he killed the young man, have one of two reactions. It flees. One, the first reaction is people flee away from the danger. And you know that that's uh, notorious about what happened to World War I veterans. Uh, they would hear a car backfire and they would hit the ground thinking that it was shell fire. Uh, the second reaction, however, and this is a, a rare reaction, is that people, if they've gone through this trauma, try to do it again to prove that they can conquer the fear that this trauma induced in them. So we know more about PTSD now, and I think Pete had a case of PTSD. Um, Harvard has done a lot, a medical doctor at Harvard has done a lot of research into suicide, and he found that uh, potential victims of suicide uh, engage in a series of near-death accidents to practice subconsciously their final act. Uh, their psychological pressure closes them off from other people. They lose friends. Um, there is often a slight precipitating factor uh, that uh, may be very tiny, but it kicks them off. And then in some cases, and this is, of course, the key uh, to proving suicide, there's an announcement in a note or gesture. Pete began to practice suicide. One of my uncles knew him well. Pete decided to buy an airplane. Eddie Rickenbacker had talked him into it. Peter DePaulo told him it was a great idea. And Pete bought a Waco uh, biplane. And one day he was taking off from an airport in Knoxville, and the engine cut out. Uh, they couldn't turn around. It flopped into the Tennessee River upside down. Pete uh, got out very quickly. His, his co-pilot was trapped, but Pete went back down into the water and uh, freed this guy from the, from the seatbelt. Uh, lost part of a finger, had bones, as you can see, damaged his eye. And as we go through this, you're going to see that more and more Pete began to have ac what we would call accidents, but they're not really accidents. Now, there was no doubt about the kind of professional driver Pete was. You see a picture here of Pete shaking hands with Henry Ford. This was taken in 1932. Ford was standing in turn one in the infield. Pete came down and did a 360, a Danny Sullivan move. And Ford said, that guy can really drive. I want to meet him. And uh, they ushered Pete up and he met uh, Henry Ford. So Henry Ford, who was a pretty good driver himself in the old days, Barney Oldfield days, um, realized that Pete was, could handle cars. And he was well known for being extremely, extremely good at recovering from spins. Um, he had a series of accidents, three personal wrecks, in 1932, he saw five deaths at Indy in 1933. Plane crash was 32. Um, then I found this interesting uh, item. Uh, Dave Lewis, a, a driver who had been in Indy and raced several years, uh, was, had retired and moved to California. Dave one day shot himself, and I found an article uh, in the Indianapolis newspaper that said there was a lot of talk about suicide at the track the other day. It said many people don't believe that Dave Lewis uh, committed suicide. And then a driver is quoted as saying, Dave would not have done it with a pistol 
if he had wanted to kill himself, he would have just lifted his hands when he was going into one of the turns at Indy and crashed through the wall. So as much as we would like to believe that suicide is not something that's considered in racing circles, uh, this proves that it was pretty hot topic uh, from time to time. My, another uncle of mine, and by the way, I should say we were the poor side of the family. These people are extremely wealthy. They're still extremely wealthy. And my side of the family did not inherit any of that wealth, so uh, unfortunately. But uh, my, my uncle, who now deceased, uh, people would ask Pete. He was very famous in Knoxville, and people would say, Pete, are you going to win it this year? Is this going to be the year? And in 1934, Pete said to him, I'm either going to win it or I'm coming home in a pine box. And my uncle swore that he was not kidding. Uh, when he got to Indy, his old friends, very famous drivers, uh, Fred Frame, uh, people like that who were car owners, wouldn't give him a car. They had heard about all of these accidents. And they... They, he was very disgusted, and this was part of the movement toward, I think, toward suicide. He, uh, uh, Fred Frame finally assigned a car to him with only two days left to qualify. And uh, Pete qualified the car. It was a good car. It was a Miller 91, and he, he loved it. The day of, his, of Pete's death, uh, he saw an accident on the way to practice in which two people were killed. He stopped the taxi that he was taking to the track, tried to save the lives of these people, and unfortunately they both died. I think this is the precipitating factor. I told you it could be slight. That's perhaps not very slight. I want to show you those two slides. This is the same man in nine years, over nine years. Look, look at the change from this optimistic uh, young man in 1925 to this old man in 1934. That's hard to, hard to account for. Nine years. He looks like he's aged 30 years. And I think this gives us a clue. In 1935, at, uh, at Daytona Beach, uh, Malcolm Campbell was trying out the Bluebird. And uh, a, an AP reporter, the AP reporter for racing, got together a group of Indianapolis experts. Pop Myers was there, if you know him. He was vice president. Eddie Rickenbacker's brother was there. Uh, Bill Cummings, who had won the 1934 race, was there. And they had drinks in a bar at the Clarendon Hotel right on the beach. They, they went through what I call an inquest, coroner's jury, into what happened to Pete Chris. And they noted these things, that it was practice, there were no other cars on the track, he was driving at a relatively slow speed. They had examined the car. There were no mechanical defects. There were no impediments on the track. No skid marks. He hadn't tried to brake. He hadn't tried to steer out of the, the thing. As the reporter said, it appears that his car was under control when he went up on the wall. And then this phrase appears. And Pete was apparently in good health and spirits. If you know anything, that's an invitation to draw a conclusion that this was suicide. But they didn't draw that conclusion. They said they have, they finally decided they just couldn't reach a conclusion. They called it the strangest death in all racing history. Questions remain. Could Pete really have taken, if this is suicide, could he have taken, could he have 
taken a, a, a riding mechanic along with him. That's the biggest objection. Um, the researchers that I've read point to the fact that when someone is on the verge of suicide, he just closes down and he's got a, a, a psychic vision that just closes down and he doesn't consider other things. There was, of course, a precipitating event. Uh, we know that, that suicide can be an impulsive act. Uh, he could, however, and this is my alternative, had been having a flashback. He mentioned these flashbacks. He talked about them and he said, when I, every now and then I lose my nerve, but I get it back. And it, it may have been that he was having those flashbacks. But the biggest thing, of course, is there was no note or gesture. Now, I told you about Pete's sister, Hazel. Hazel was quite old when I met her, a wonderful lady, just just wonderful person. Strong, energetic, all th you know, th three of her brothers died and she took over the family and ran the, uh, ran the outfit. When she, she called me one day and said, Bill, I need you to come down, we need to have a, one of our talks. And when I got to her home, this big Italianate villa, she said, Bill, I, I have something I haven't told you. And I could see she was getting old and, and she knew she was headed for the last roundup. And I said, well, Hazel, what, what is it? And she said, Pete knew he was going to die that day. And I said, well, Hazel, how do you know that? How do you know that he, he knew? She said he had a premonition. And she had, we'd, we'd been talking for years, and she hadn't told me this story. I said, well, how do you know this? She said, Pete had a diamond ring. And I used to tease him about that diamond ring. Every time I would see him, I'd say, Pete, when are you going to give me that ring? I want that ring. And uh, he would tease her back. They were very close. And he'd say, no, 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 Hazel, it's not time for you to get the diamond yet. Well, um, right before the practice run, right before Pete went out for his last run, he took the ring off, gave it to the pit captain, and said, if anything happens to me, make sure that my sister gets this ring. Now, Hazel saw this as a premonition, that it was God's will that Pete was going to die, and she knew it, he knew it, and he accepted it. I see it as a gesture announcing that he had decided to commit suicide. And that's the, that's the final, or the closing, near the closing chapter of the book. Uh, that's what has convinced me. I don't know of any other way to interpret this. I don't believe in premonitions of this sort. Now, the end of the Chris dynasty. Pete's father was overjoyed because the tombstone was named the best tombstone of the year 1935 by the New York Times. Uh, I guess that's a runner-up prize, but uh, at any rate, you can see here the car. Uh, Pete's brother, John, died in a car crash that he caused. He was encouraging a man to go faster. They had a, one of the old throttles on the steering wheel. He jammed the throttle forward, crashed into an abutment, and it killed him. His brother Harmon had been gassed in World War I, and he died of alcoholism uh, a year later. They all died within three years. Uh, three self-destructive deaths, N none of the boys reached 40. It's just like the Kennedy story. You know, three sons dying of violence. Hey, his wife, John's wife, died of heart attack. And then if you're writing a novel, you could put this in. 
the state condemned their beautiful farm and converted it to an insane asylum. And uh, I have said that that makes an ironic statement about the family, what kind of family it was. I believe that the father was one of these hard-driving patriarchs who, who drove his sons to death. And then John, shortly after World War II, uh, died in a fall from the barn. The Chris line ended, no male heirs, and the dynasty dissolved into thin air. There are no Chris's left of that line. And uh, the family continues to have uh, some unbelievably either bad luck or self-destructive tendencies. This is all that's left. There's the tombstone. My wife, uh, who's seated over here, uh, would come up to about right here on this. It's huge. They had to put a concrete uh, foundation six feet deep underneath it to keep it level. Uh, and uh, that is the story of Pete Chris. And let me thank you for your attention, but let me also say um, I am particularly eager for you to ask me any question uh, that, that might offer another alternative to the, um, to the story of Pete's demise. Uh, I had to reach the conclusion I reached. And it's not a happy conclusion. Uh, but if you have other ideas, you won't offend me. I've, uh, I've been questioned by CNN, New York Times, and uh, uh, you won't offend me by any questions you may have. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. This <laughs> you may have retired the trophy, one of the more interesting presentations we've ever had. I'll, I'll put that right out front. We got some questions. By the way, I'm suffering a malady today. I should tell you, I, I have some difficulty in hearing. And uh, uh, wouldn't you know that my hearing aids died last night? We'll have a burial here. So uh, I, may, I may struggle to understand you, but. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, can you please read the uh, the line on the tombstone on the bottom, the very bottom? Yeah. Uh, you know, the tombstone is very interesting. And uh, in the book, I sort of analyzed it. Uh, the last lap, it, it's, it, it, it reflects more the father, John Chris, than it does Steve Chris. This guy is waving a checkered flag. And it says the last lap. And by the way, the other line is Indianapolis Speedway. This is a portrait of the. And but I I talk about the way that uh, I think John really inflated his son's uh, reputation. The last lap indicates suggests I think that uh, there was a victory involved. The black and white checkered flag suggests that. And uh, these, these are somewhat misleading. And some of the people in Knoxville uh, remarked on that when it came up. Did uh, Pete's brothers have any uh, children? Uh, there were no children. Uh, I'll tell you this story. Uh, uh, the sad part about this family is there's a history of suicide in this family. And to be honest with you, I had, I had promised Hazel that I would write this biography. And I did not include the notion about the other people committing suicide. There was one son of John, the older brother. He wanted to be an opera singer, and they had the money to make that happen. And John was trying out to be an opera singer. One day he had been uh, put down uh, by a music director and was told he just did not have the voice to be an opera singer. 
He went home and uh, chiseled out a part of a of the floor, a wooden floor. And he took a butcher knife and jammed the handle of that butcher knife into the floor and then fell on the knife and killed himself. And this is the way this family has lived. Uh, very sad business. And I could tell you, you would know them. Uh, I guess I could, can go ahead and say this. This family owned all of the Ruby Tuesday restaurants in the United States. That's what they did with their money following this, uh, this sad event. But it's a family that is filled with tragedy after tragedy and still going on. I wonder if today it would be possible to do a computer simulation of that situation and see the circumstances under which a car could leap up over that wall. You know, it's, it is an amazing uh, thing. It is an amazing situation. I, I, I wondered about that, and then I came across this uh, picture of the berm. And I think if it were going uh, fast enough, and 100 would certainly be fast enough, that it would go up that berm, get a bump off that berm, and then be propelled along the wall. Uh, I, I have not, I found this in a book by the official um, track historian. And this picture, and it just said these berms were intended to direct cars back onto the track if they were headed into the turn wrong. But they, turned, they tended to get cars airborne. And they were done away with two or three years after that. So uh, I wish I knew more. Uh, if you've ever uh, tried to research things at Indianapolis, um, it's difficult. They're not as welcoming as our research center down here. Uh, and, you know, you need to go through, really get, do a deep dive into archival stuff to, to find that out. But I think it was that berm. And there were berms at each of the corners. So. Yeah, I was going to ask, what was his relationship with these riding mechanic? Because he, he was killed, right, in the, in the wreck? I mean, it seems like he tried to save people. He would do that and take the life of somebody and stuff? Or? Well, that's, you know, that's the one, to me, that's the one uh, flaw in my uh, argument. Yeah. Uh, could he really have, have decided to do himself in at a time that he had another person in the car? Yeah. Now, I must admit I gave in to psychological uh, theorizing. And what I said was that it might have reminded him that of the young man he had in his car when he had the accident yeah. in Knoxville that he had a passenger in the right front seat. Um, and, and that's the only thing I have. And I, and I must say, uh, I, I thought long and hard. And if you read the book, you will see my sort of agonizing over this interpretation. But the, uh, the, the diamond ring story is such powerful evidence that I have to believe that that's what he did. Okay. And what about his, his brother and his father? Was, did they, was that a suicide too? Or, I mean, uh, could have been? No, I don't think he did. He was, uh, this man never gave up. Never gave up. Okay. Um, uh, he was the son of a Civil War hero. They did foolish things to test their luck. Uh, foolish, foolish things. And he taught his sons to do foolish things. So it was a difficult thing. May I, I see we're reaching the end and, and, and I've enjoyed this. Can I tell you one more story? And this is just very brief. Um, this, uh, this combines a lot of uh, the elements of this weekend for me. Um, when I was, some years ago, 
uh, I had written part of this book, and I've written this book a hundred times, different ways. Uh, I decided that the, the, the quickest way to, to get the story out would be to get Paul Newman to do a movie about Pete. And uh, I thought about uh, how to do that. And I knew uh, a man that probably many of you have met, uh, uh, Reeves Calloway. Reeves set up his cars, Paul Newman's cars. And I gave Reeves a call, a uh, very welcoming sort of fellow, really nice guy. And I said, I, I need 15 minutes of your time to tell you a story. And he said, sure, come on up. And my wife and I drove up to Connecticut, and I had a, a, a picture book then, and I gave him this, this whole thing that you've just seen. And he said, well, that's a very interesting story. How do I fit in? And I said, I want you to give this to Paul Newman and see if he'll do a movie of it. And he said, Paul will love this story. And he took the books and took them to Paul Newman. And Paul decided he could not do it because he was too old to play the lead. And so now I have a very nice letter from Paul Newman on my wall. And uh, that's the end of my uh, near miss, let's say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, that's probably retired the trophy, at least for a good while, of uh, incredible presentations we've had.